Good evening, EC, and all of our online family. Uh, what a joy it is to greet you another Tuesday evening and uh, bring you a word of encouragement, a word of inspiration, a word of exhortation, and just share some things that are on my heart with you. Um, I am so excited about this month of June in spite of what we're dealing with, with the chaos in the climate and still COVID-19, uh, we understand is still with us. It is not gone anywhere and it's gonna be around for a while. And they're encouraging us to build up our immune system that we could be getting ready in the next few weeks for a peak again. So I'm telling you, just prepare and uh, get yourselves prepared for what could be. Don't forget to stock up for the winter. They're predicting uh, that this would be the worst of modern times of winters, uh, particularly when it comes to goods and, and uh, uh, things that we do rely on to sustain us during the winter months. Get those freezers, get those things um, stocked up and make sure you notice expiration dates. Get those dates that are 221 and 222. Watch 220 dates for those things that you're planning to store. Make sure the expiration dates are 221 and 222. Uh, well, as we're in the midst and we're fighting this COVID-19 pandemic, let me say something. A pandemic is a pandemic, regardless of what name you put on it. And as we're fighting COVID-19, we're also fighting, as many are said, racism 20, which is another pandemic. You've seen the uh, protests in the streets. You've seen videos that have gone viral as we're fighting, again, the criminal justice system, the systemic racism that we're seeing exist. And all across the country, all across the universe, the globe, there are many countries that have joined us, name by name, list by list. Uh, you've seen it on the news, and they're protesting in larger numbers against the injustice that they're seeing uh, uh, against black people and people of color. But I want to just talk a little bit about my story and about my um, relationships uh, growing up and connections that uh, I've had with people across uh, racial lines and how those things have affected me for the good and even for the bad, this spirit of racism that we've been dealing with for 401 years. And what's so funny, you might notice I'm sitting at a desk that is an old school desk but this desk has a symbolic, uh, has a symbolism in my life. Uh, it is very nostalgic and it took me back uh, to the 60s and the 70s uh, as I was going, uh, transitioning from grade school, from the desk where you shared the cubby holes with the person next to you and moving to the seventh grade where you walk into classrooms and these are the first desks you see, desk of your own. I was kind of laughing a little bit, talk about discrimination. As so I remember uh, reading about discrimination and I remember going to one of the counselors and saying that all of the desks in the classrooms were for right-handed people and there were no desks for left-handed people. And I'm for sure that they made desks for left-handed people. So they did some checking and research and it wasn't long those classes that I had because I am left-handed, uh, they got me some left-handed desks. But I wanna speak about my story um, this climate of chaos, how it has created such an atmosphere uh, as we are focusing on black lives. Now, all lives matter, that's a given, but we don't want to miss the reality of the moment that our focus has been on our black men and now black women and the injustices that are portrayed upon them by uh, white police officers, particularly has been the focus, but just by the white community, period, uh, those that are ignorant of the fact and those that do things intentionally. And thank God for the bridge builders. Thank God for those that have reached out and have no respect to person. And uh, they are saying, that might have been my forefathers. Uh, we can't uh, have anything, well, we, we can't repay you for anything that they've done. Only thing that we can do is say that curse stops here and we want to be different and we want to turn this tide. Uh, a pandemic, again, is a pandemic regardless of the name you put on it. And one of the things that I'm saying now is stop seeing racism as an issue and see it as a people. The first thing that I, I want to focus on this evening, that racism is evil, and you're hearing that. And what joy brings me to hear my white brothers and hear my white sisters proclaim that, to stand hand in hand 
in with brothers and sisters in protest and across the country. I mean, it has really been as the late president, as, as our President Barack Obama, our former President Barack Obama has said that how it has brought an exhilaration to him for this next generation for them to get it. And it's not just them standing upon the shoulders of another generation, uh, but it is all of them coming together, Puerto Rican, Asian, uh, brown people, black people, uh, you name it. And they're there on the front lines from all walks of life, from all professions. And uh, I just think it's a wonderful thing to see the world come together like that and fight something that is evil. I want to share a passage of scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 9 from the NIV and also from the uh, New American Standard Bible. And here's how it reads. It says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And what that's really saying, that, that, that racism is a pure evil. And that's what Paul is telling us. Evil is hypocritical love. That's what evil is, um, and uh, it is. Uh, that's what racism is. It is evil. It's a hypocritical love. It's loving some and not loving others. It's almost like pick and choose. I'll love you if you're a black person and you make good money or you have a good job, then I'll love you. But then if you're a black person that's poor and you have nothing, then I see no reason to love you. That can be a real good picture of racism there. Uh, I, I thought about uh, when I was five years old and, and my family sometimes tell me, how do you remember things? But I remember uh, when I was five, six, seven years old and, and we moved into a all white neighborhood and that's after the 51 flood had come in the area where we were living and then the urban renewal came through and took a lot of the property, took the property where, where we live. But in that community, it was called the Armstrong community, and they still have their reunions today, uh, the black community from that community. But in that community was Croatian, it was Polish, it was white, and it was amazing. The unity uh, that my family would talk about and uh, how that community so bonded. And back in the day was when my dad would deliver coal uh, to many of those homes that you see all down in the plaza. I can remember uh, as a teenager being in school, uh, dad still maintained relationships with uh, rich people in Brookside up in Mission Hills. And he was the man, the black man that delivered the coal to them for those coal furnaces. But uh, they had such a bonding in that community. And, and the, to, to, to testify their bonding, uh, it was so amazing because uh, the house that my mom uh, was deceased from, that the last home her and my dad purchased, when uh, we bought that home for them, uh, my mom called me one day. I was still with IBM. And uh, she said, I saw a house I really like. I want that home. And um, so I, I got on it. And when I called and inquired about it, uh, to be honest, uh, the owner of the house thought I was white on the phone. And uh, when I showed up at his door, uh, his mouth fell open, and uh, he just looked, and he said, oh, okay, like I didn't expect you to be black, and I just left corporate America, had my nice suit on, had my tie on, and first question came out of his mouth, it's like, are you a lawyer? Are you a doctor? And I said, no, and so I said, I'm the gentleman that called you, my mom wanted to see the house, it's up for sale, and the long and short of the story, uh, we toured the house, came back, got my dad, took him to the house and not knowing that the neighbors really didn't want a black family in the house. And so um, we were uh, talking about finalizing things on the house and then right at the point that we were to finalize the papers, the banks had a freeze on making loans. So they weren't making any loans. And so uh, we were getting ready to go. And so the owner of the house, who was a realtor too, said to my dad and mom, he says, you know, we really got to sell the house because my daughter has an incurable disease. She had to move to Arizona to a hotter climate, and she's really going through when her husband found out she had this disease. He divorced her, left her with her kids, and they wanted to move so they could be close to their daughter. And so my dad said, well, what's wrong with your daughter? And they told my dad, and my dad said, do you mind if we pray? So Dad Vaughn, as you would know him, caught hands with this white family in their living room, and my mom and dad prayed that God would sustain her that God would add years to her life and give them a miracle with their daughter. That touched that family so that he called me and he said, Jack, I need you to bring your mom and dad out to the house. And we went out to the house and he said, you know, I know the banks have a freeze everywhere. Nobody's loaning anybody any money, but I am so touched by your family that I don't want anybody to have this house 
but your mom and your dad. And so he said, I'm going to carry a personal contract on this house myself. I'm a realtor. I know how to do it. I'll carry the note and uh, da 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 because I want your mom and dad in this house. We've got to move, and I want Mrs. Vaughn in this house by Mother's Day. But what was so funny, uh, they never put a sign in the yard to say the house was sold. And uh, so when we finalized the deal on the house, and uh, I told my mom and dad, knowing what, I didn't exactly explain everything to them in the neighborhood of what I called rift of that they were thinking, uh, who was gonna buy this house, and definitely nobody black. And I say, we're gonna move at night. And we moved at night very quietly. I made sure that everybody that was moving was very quietly, make no noise outside. And when the neighbors woke up the next morning, uh, they were saying good morning to black neighbors. And uh, to confirm my story, my mom's neighbor uh, was of a different ethnic ethnicity. She was not white, and the white ladies in the neighborhood would have their poker parties or bridge parties. And she told my mom one day, she says, they don't know I'm not white. She said, if they know really my ethnicity, she said, they probably would have nothing to do with me. And so her and my mom began to bond, and uh, she had an incurable disease, and she was not able to go anywhere. Her husband traveled all the time. She had to wear masks. She looked like COVID every day with mask on. But my mom would call her, check on her, and pray with her. And so she passed away. She was Croatian. And, and so when she passed away, we found out where the service was going to be. And guess what? The service was in the community where my family used to live before we moved, before the, great, uh, before the flood in 1951. So we go to this funeral home. And it's a Polish funeral home. We go there, and uh, oh my God, there is there's people everywhere. Now my dad is in his old age. Keep in mind, dad is in his 80s right about then. And so when we walk in, I take mom and dad, and all of these people start running to my dad, white, Polish, a Croatian, and they were saying Willie. That was my dad's name, Willie, Willie. That's Willie, and everybody was hugging my dad and hugging my mom. And I, I stood back and I went like, wow, look at this, look at this. They were genuinely glad to see him. You could tell it was like everybody was a family. And that's why I know that racism is a disease. That's why I know it's something that people have to want to hold on to because you don't have to be racist regardless of what race that you are. And neither do you have to be prejudiced. But I saw something and it was so rewarding and so refreshing. When we walked away from there, it was like we were at a family reunion or just left other family members. So when they left that neighborhood and we moved to the neighborhood, uh, when I was five years old, when uh, again, an all-white neighborhood, one of two of the first black families there, and I saw the school, I was talking to my oldest sister, and, and she was saying how that we were one of the first of maybe three black families that were part of that neighborhood, went to that school, and we um, saw it evolve. And I didn't know what white flight then was, but I knew houses were going up for sale everywhere, and people were moving out, whites were moving out, and blacks were moving in. And uh, only to see uh, the uh, school line uh, that they had where you would go to the black school on one side of the town, the northeast side, and the white school on the northwest side. Well, they changed the boundaries, and by the time I was in the sixth grade and getting ready to go to seventh grade, which some of the older siblings had gone to Northeast Junior High School, which was all black, all black teachers, and Sumner High School, which was all black teachers predominantly and all black students. Well, I ended up going to all white school, went to Northwest, and it was so strange walking in those neighborhoods, and this was right after the 68, uh, the 67, 66, and my sister was reminding me she was taking her senior finals uh, when J.F. Kennedy got shot, and school was dismissed. They just stopped school, sent everybody home. And we were just talking about the change and what we saw grow growing up in transition, uh, dealing with racism. So I, I go to Northwest and uh, I always knew that, that the way to make change was to be a leader or to step out. So, you know, I would go and run for office in middle school, or they call it middle school, now we call it junior high school, and uh, want to be on every committee because I thought the way to bring about change was to have a representation. So I would have a voice, I would have a vote. Well, it, being in Northwest Junior High School then, and then you're going to Wyandotte, that was big. That was like college campus for us, if you know anything about Wyandotte High School, predominantly white. And I remember um, uh, on my way to uh, my sophomore year, and 
uh, they were having class officers and they were uh, saying, who wants to run, send your petition in, uh, sign up, just like they do in politics and submit your application. And I said, you know what, uh, this is a predominantly all white school. Who is to say that we can't have black leadership in this school? And so I told some of my peers, let's say, well, I'm gonna run for class president. And others had said to me, oh, all of those white kids aren't gonna vote for somebody black to be in president. And Martin Luther King had given great speeches then. And uh, I remember the Black Panthers. I remember uh, seeing Quindaro Boulevard and places like that set on fire, just like you see. I remember that from the 60s as a kid. And I remember that morning going into my parents' bedroom and I said to my dad, I said, Dad, I'm going to run for class office and people are saying that um, it's a predominantly white school, I'm black, they aren't going to vote me in to be the president of their class. And I said, will you pray with me that I'll be the one to bring about change? So Dad laid his hands on me, anointed me with oil and uh, sent me on my way to school. And I remember going to school in that auditorium, that massive auditorium, about 2,000 seats, predominantly all white and just a handful of blacks uh, that were there at that time. And I call it my Martin Luther King speech. I gave it about coming together, about working together, how God has created all of us equal. And, and when I finished, at the end of my speech, I got a standing ovation. And at the end of the day, uh, when they came across the intercom, they said, our sophomore class president, and I think if I recall right, they told me I was the first black to ever be a class president at that all white school. And they said, our sophomore class president is Jack Vaughn. And you could hear screams all in the hall. And by that time, the bell's ringing to dismiss us. And if you were at um, our church when we had our class reunion, uh, my class came that Sunday, and I asked them to stand. Uh, they sang the song they sang when I became president of the sophomore class. Uh, after uh, the bell and ring were in the hall, and all of the white kids, the football players, everybody came and got me, and they held me up in the air as they walked me through the hall saying, he's a jolly good fella, he's a jolly good fella, for nobody can deny. And it was so, but it was an amazing transition for that high school and even for me then. And then as uh, we were, you know, going through and making the transition, the adjustment, whites making the adjustments to blacks in the school, that wasn't without a challenge. You know, the lunchroom, blacks on one side, whites on the other side, but I intentionally wanted to be that bridge. And I can remember uh, uh, being in my senior class, fast forwarding, and I'm sitting in a chemistry class and we had a chemistry teacher and uh, I just knew he was racist from, I mean, he just wanted you to know he didn't like blacks. And he really didn't want you in his class, but he didn't have a choice. And uh, I remember he was giving a lecture on something, and somehow the race issue came up, and uh, he used the N-word and say, you ends. And when he said that, you know, everybody, you know, uh, you know, you look at me now, and it was so funny, because uh, people have said to me, oh, Bishop, say, wow, I didn't know you had another side of you like that. And my wife often teases and say, you know, she got a little thug. And I guess a little thug came out. Uh, we went, yeah, you know, the, the, everybody protesting is not a thug, okay? But anyway, the little thug came out in me, and I stood up, and the teacher said, you need to sit down. I said, no, I'm not going to sit down, and you're not going to talk to us like that and use that kind of language in this class. And so he said, I said, sit down. And I said, I said, I'm not going to sit down. And I walked out of the class, and I was walking out. He was calling me to come back, but I kept walking. And some of the blacks that were in the class, he said he called me a name, and I won't even tell you what that name was. He called me when I walked out. And normally when you walk in the office, uh, the, the secretary's reception will say, can I help you? And uh, they saw fire in my face. And I walked straight past the secretary's, straight past our white principal's uh, uh, office, right into our vice principal, who was black, into his office. And so when I came in the door, he said, Vaughn, what's wrong with you? And I said, and, and I was holding my emotions back, and I did this, and I pointed down the hall. I said, you better go down there, and you better go down there now because he is out of control. And I said some other things and told him how I felt, told him what was said, and by that time, he slams his hand on the desk, he says a few words that we're not in the Bible, and he stands up and he says, I'm going down there with you, and he goes down there, calls him out of the class, and he said, what's going on? And so I refused to go back to that class, and uh, I, they did not make me go back to that class. They allowed me to sit in the office for a while and to choose uh, another option 
other than, than his class. But my point on that, you know, had that been in a time like this, this was in the 70s, things probably would have been totally different. And only later to find out that same man that had all that animosity of, of blacks and people of color in, in his heart uh, had a heart attack right in the class, in front of the class, in front of one of his classes, and passed away. So, you know, leaving high school, and I'm just kind of sharing my story, leaving high school, graduating in 1972, and at that time they were building the Kansas City, Kansas Community College. And that's out on uh, 70, uh, 70th and, and State Avenue. And they were building that. And here I am, you know, still we're dealing with this racism that's in our city, that's in our county, that's sort of subtle. People are trying to uh, overcome it. And um, I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to make a difference here. Uh, after I did not choose to take that scholarship to Harvard, I thought I would stay here and help my dad in ministry, as many of you have shared, uh, shared my story with you. So uh, I enrolled in community college and uh, put application in to be the student leader there and to find out that I was the first black uh, president of the class that they've had because they just built that campus. And it was such an honor. And even now, that's where I walk. Uh, when we take our walks, we walked at campus. I was telling my grandchildren, uh, my two grandsons, as they would walk with me sometime in the summers, I said, you see this campus? I remember when all of this was being built. And I remember being called in to the president's office, and they said, we're getting ready to have the dedication of this campus, and we want you to be the MC of the ceremony. All state officials, all government officials were coming uh, for the uh, dedication of that campus. And what an honor, and I just thought, man, this is amazing. Uh, you know, to see when the hand of God is upon you to make change and the hand of God is upon you for reconciliation and to bring cultures together and to bring races together, to close that racial divide, it is really amazing. And so I am seeing the dedication of that campus. And to me, that, that's history right there. That says to me that it, things can be done it says to me that we can come together. And then only to deal with that growing up in the neighborhoods that, that we grew up in and the schools that we went going to and then to get married. I uh, have a beautiful wife, Carolyn. As you know, she's our, our, our leading lady at EC. Pastor Carolyn over our women's, women's ministry have three wonderful sons, Cortez, Julian and Justin, and you know, you have your, your, your children, and, and you don't want your children to think they have to experience some of the things that you experience. So, you know, Carolyn and, and I, you know, have Cortez, she gives birth to him. So we're excited, you know, uh, he's a very talented baby. Uh, I mean, love music, and, and he's gifted in music. And Cortez, I tell you, uh, he would take his mom's pie pans, uh, take her pots, and everything was a drum in the house. He's just playing drums all of the time. Well, he goes to kindergarten, and, and this is one of my concerns right now in our educational system, when we have teachers that don't understand our children, they don't understand the giftedness, particularly of, of our black boys. And uh, so he's in kindergarten, and his mom is from the field of education, a teacher, and uh, undoubtedly, her and I are gonna ask when he comes home from school, how was your day today? How did school go today? And we start noticing the change in Cortez and uh, that he didn't want to go to school. And I'm saying to parents, if you're listening to me, uh, that, you know, and, and, and my heart gets heavy sometimes for kids that don't have advocators, that don't have an advocate for them, that don't have a mediator, that don't have somebody that can, can hear them and can hear them without them saying anything and to move on their behalf. And that's why this desk means so much to me because when I came and sat at this desk, it took me back to education. It took me back to my years of being in school, the things I had to deal with, the challenges I had, and yet the victories I had along the way. And so I'm, I'm feeling real good with this, connecting with history, connecting with my past as I am connecting with the present. And so we, we start asking questions and then Cortez finally came and told us that he's been set in the hall. Keep in mind, this is his first two weeks in school. What kid wouldn't wanna go to school and the teacher sitting you in the hallway? And uh, so, uh, you know, you need to know with Pastor Carolyn, her children are not the ones to mess with. If you want to get her fired up and, and, and you don't mess with her children. And immediately she says, we're going up there. So we go up there and we meet with this teacher, which is a white, older, older, older white female lady. And so she says, well, he's always taking his sticks doing this. And it's just distracting. So I just sit him out in the hall all day and give him his lessons. Why would you sit a kindergartner first uh, uh, experienced the school in the hall all day 
and give him the work there. It's almost like saying to him, I don't want you in my class, I don't like you. And so his mom said, he's probably playing the drums because he plays drums. And later we would ask Cortez, he said, I hear music, I hear music all the time. Well, he's around music all the time, around music at home, uh, around music at church, everywhere he goes. Music is his, was his being, music was who he was. It was his life and his breath was music. And so just like it is for Julian now, uh, Justin has to call, but he suppresses it with his golden saxophone that he has at home that's still in the case. But nevertheless, going back to Cortez, but, uh, and he would hear music. So we address the issue and say, that's not right. And come to find out, we start talking to other parents who had had black boys, who had had the same experience with that same teacher. And uh, it got so bad of what was happening to the black boys in that classroom that we had to take it to the school above her, to her director. And so we said to the director, as my wife's in education, so she knew the ranks and, uh, of where we needed to go and what we needed to do. And so we met with the director of all kindergarten teachers of the school district uh, off-site at a whole other school. They set it up for us. And we explained to it and said, look, we've been doing research and this is happening. But because of her tenure and the director did not want to make waves because if she had made ways for her, it could put her job in jeopardy. jeopardy. So here we have uh, a, a black kid who giftedness is being stifled, who's being labeled as maybe there is a uh, learning disability or learning problem there. These are just some of the things that, that black kids deal with in a school system where they have teachers that don't understand their background or the reality of the moment of black lives. And so, Justin, we move into our neighborhood uh, that we're in now. And, um, you know, I, I think about uh, when we talk about communities and we talk about a racial divide. And I remember that house that we're in now uh, when I first drove by and saw the sign in the yard. And I said, man, uh, you know, I'd love to have that house. And I remember calling, just wanted to see how much the house was. And when I called, it was a husband and wife realtor. And um, they basically said to me, uh, that if you're not pre-approved, we're not showing the house. And uh, basically saying that uh, if I was black, then, you know, the house was not even to be considered. And I'm thinking, okay, now nah, something's wrong with this picture. And then when I met them, uh, I said, now nah, something's wrong. And so my sister, who is with the Lord now, Shantae was dealing with a lawyer, uh, a realtor rather, a, a white realtor, and I talked to her realtor and I said, you know, I saw this house and this is what they're telling me. He said, let me see. He did some research. He said, I can get you in and show you that house. So he got me in and when we made the appointment to meet with him, the white couple showed up, husband and wife. And when I walked through the door, I took my dad with me uh, so we could at least see if it was something uh, that needed or was mechanically wrong with the house. And when they saw I was black, it was like, oh no, oh no, this can't happen. And long and short of the story, it did happen. And I know when we moved in, my neighbor next door, uh, he didn't like blacks. He was an older white man, and he wouldn't speak to me. I did my best every day to speak to him, to try to befriend him, talk to him. He looked at me, and he turned his head. But Justin was in the fifth grade, I believe, and he was on a field trip. And going on that field trip, their bus was driving past our subdivision. And as the bus is driving by the subdivision, you know, he's excited like most kids would be because that's his new house over there, the new subdivision that the realtors that originally had the house didn't want us to move into. And so he says, that's where I live over there. And when he said that, uh, his teacher, who is an older white lady, said, you wish you lived over there. And again, coming home, uh, our first thing, well, how was your day today? His, Carolyn's always going to ask, anything happened today that we need to know about? And so he told his mom the story. She calls me, think I might have been at the office, and she said, oh, my, I'm on my way to the school. And I said, well, what's going on? And she told me the scenario. I said, well, do I need to come? She said, no, I got this. And so she went up there and, and talked to the teacher, and she said, so he says he lives over there, and you're saying you wish, that you wish you lived over there. So are you saying that? He doesn't know where he lived, and so her response was, well, you know how kids make up stuff? And so she said, why would he make up something and make up where he lives? 
And so uh, long and short after that, uh, something happened, I think, on the playground with Justin and another classmate. And they got into a little uh, disagreement, a little conflict. And so they come in, again, his mom asked him, how was things at school? He said, well, the teacher stood me and another black kid up before the class after play recess and said, and this is why we have black on black crime. All right, that's another thing. Sent fire in Pastor Carolyn's eyes and we went up to the school, talked to the teacher and, um, and, and said, that is definitely uh, out of line right there. And uh, next thing I know, I'm getting a call from the principal, getting a call from school officials. And I wasn't thinking then that perhaps I could have been set up because people told me that was a lawsuit right there. But I wasn't thinking lawsuit because we were so infuriated about how black kids, particularly black boys and our own son, was being treated. And so when we look at the racial discrimination and when we look at this racial divide, that race is pure, e this racism is pure evil. It is not from God. And you know, when I think uh, about even the education system, and I, I certainly am thankful for family that I grew up in, uh, my brother Willie, uh, he was in the uh, early classes of the 60s, 59 at Wyandotte. He was the only black on the team uh, during his class. He graduated, I had that in 1960. And I remember uh, everybody being excited because he's one of the first uh, to get an all state. Uh, one of the top athletes, first top black athlete in that time, one of them uh, that made all state. Uh, my brother George, uh, he and Julie uh, Copeland, uh, were the first blacks to bring a debate, first, first, uh, first, uh, first time winner, uh, what would you call it, first, first place, yeah, first place winner uh, debate in all white high school. They bought that trophy back and uh, he was the first black commencement speaker for his graduating class in 1962. And then my sister Dorothy graduated in 1963. And then Alma followed as a commencement speaker for a graduating class. And I remember saying to the Lord then, uh, speaking of education, that, you know, I'd like to be the commencement speaker to the, the class uh, that they told me I could not uh, as a black person, be a leader too. And then I, I, I prayed and wanted to be the commencement speaker to the graduating class in 1972. And I was one of those that were blessed with that honor. So I, I'm very thankful for those that have paved the way for me. I'm very thankful for uh, what I've seen God do with my life in bridging the gap uh, with different races and different communities. And, uh, you know, when I think about Luke 18 and 11, when the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And that's what uh, racism is. It is pure self-righteousness, as we see in Luke chapter 13, uh, Luke chapter 13 and 11 here. Uh, believing that a race is better than another one and feeling superior is pure evil. And as I've said before, God didn't create a racial divide. God created diversity. And, uh, you know, when we moved again, you know, I, I saw God just do some great things uh, in, in, in our lives because when we were in the marketplace, let me share this, uh, of a building of the church that we're in now at 1800 Washington. And when I was in high school, uh, and um, we stay after class sometimes, and I was in theater and, and speech and uh, forensics, and so a lot of times we had extracurricular activities. And we talk about race. Uh, uh, that's why the conversations, they must be had. Dialogue must be had. And when I saw the different diverse groups that were protesting, it took me back. This desk took me back to those discussions after school, pulling these desks in a circle and all of us around talking. And some of my white friends that I was very close with in high school, and since we've been out, I've gone to lunch with some of them. Uh, and they would say, you know, we don't have a problem with race, with, with blacks, but our parents do. And sometimes some of them live right in the neighborhood where 1800 is, 1800 Whites where our church is. And they would say, Jack, could you drop me off? Uh, and I said, sure, because you know, the sun had gone down and it started getting dark. And then they would remind me, you know you have to drop me off on state on the corner because you can't go up in there because my parents will beat my A if they find out I'm in the car with blacks. And, uh, and I'd take them because I knew that was not their issue. I didn't say, well, then you walk home. No, I said, I'll drop you off because I knew in their hearts they didn't have that issue. 
that their parents had that issue. And when I saw the young lady on the video uh, talking to her parents and telling her parents, why do you think like that? Uh, why do you believe like that? You know, she was in confrontation, almost like this girl is against her dad and mom who were racist. And she was saying, but that's not the way the world is supposed to be. That's why I'm grateful for this generation that's out there that's protesting peacefully and say black lives do matter because they're seeing it in the reality of the moment. They're not saying all lives don't matter. They're not saying to hell with the other people. That's not what they're saying. They're saying, see the reality of the moment. And when I look at that reality and, and when I see that I had a good friend and uh, we would walk sometimes from school and John his father passed the church right across the street from the church where we are uh, right across the street from 1800 at St. Paul and so he would say to me hey man come on uh, walk home with me and I say well I don't know about that he said come on you walk with me nobody's gonna bother you and so I would walk through the neighborhood with him and I would walk on the grounds of 1800. And at that time, my dad had a storefront church. Uh, it was on 6th and Quindaro, as they would say, in the hood on the black side of the town. And I would pray this prayer as a kid, as a young teenager. I said, man, I wish my dad had a church like this with stained glass. Because I just thought the stained glass on that building was just absolutely phenomenal. I just thought 1800 Washington was the greatest cathedral I'd ever seen in my life. And I walk in those grounds saying, I wish my dad had a church like that. Wish my dad had a church like that. Well, come to the point of time and season in ministry where we were at the hall and uh, we needed a place to give us, a, a, a solidify us, a place to give us some steadfastness and a foundation. And 1800 came up and uh, available. Well, I heard about it. There wasn't a sign in the yard, but I heard about the church being up for sale. Uh, or, or going to be for sale. And I, I, I called on it, uh, couldn't get an answer, so I said, I'm gonna go over there. So I made a ride uh, uh, over there from my office at our school on 8th Street, from the church on 7th Street. Little lady answered the door, and so I rang the bell, she said, can I help you? And I said, um, uh, I heard you're gonna sell your church, and she looked at me, like her mouth falls open, like, how do you know this? Well, it was discussed at an ecumenical meeting, and a pastor that was there called me and said, I think you need to get the lead on this. And so by that time, she cracked the door, and I kind of put my foot in the door. She didn't see it, so if the door closed, she wouldn't just slam the door in my face. And I said, ma'am, do you mind if I come in? I'd just like to come in. I've always admired this church from a kid. It is one of the most beautiful churches I've ever seen. I said, can I just come in and see it? I said, are you going to sell it? And she says, yeah, we are talking about selling it. And, um, and uh, she said, well, I'll take your name and number, and I'll have the pastor call. So the pastor did call. And if you heard my message on Sunday, you talk, heard me talk about racism in the body of Christ. And uh, so I called, made the appointment with the pastor, and he says, well, he said, my concern is you people. And when he said, you people, and everybody black knows what that means. I'm sitting across from him in the desk in his office, and I'm hearing him keep saying, you people, you people. And so he says, but my other uh, complexity is that I prayed and said, God, whoever the people are that are supposed to have this building, we do not want to put a for sale sign in the yard. Will you send them to the door? And he said, so I can't argue with the prayer I prayed, that you came to the door and maybe you people are the ones to get this church. Long and short of that story, we went and, and started the negotiations with the bank that we had been banking with all of these years. We've been banking with this bank, nice money, all of these years. So we go to the bank and we said, there's a church on 1800 Washington. They're wanting to sell. This is what we need. Go through work through all the bank papers, and we're looking at all the bank papers, and they're saying, you know what, uh, Dad Vaughn, uh, Bishop Jack, there is no problem. We can do this loan. Well, come to find out, the people at the bank, that bank no longer exists. Uh, it folded up. Um, there were persons in the neighborhood, keep in mind, this is a national historic neighborhood, predominantly all white, and there were persons in the neighborhood connected with the bank. So when they found out that the people in the church were selling then they said, who are they? And when they said it was a black congregation, comments were made, we don't want all of those, and I'll just say people, over here in this neighborhood. 
So I'm on a mission trip. We're in Africa. We're in Nigeria on a mission trip. We're supposed to get back, and we did. We got back on a Wednesday to the States. Thursday, we're supposed to meet at the law firm, sign the papers, get the keys, and Friday, we are to move in 1800 and have our first service. As far as everybody at EC knows, and it might be some of your first time hearing this story, because you know I don't share a lot from the pulpit. I'm not one of those to bash people or to hold bitterness or to be angry. But as I've been saying, you got to call it out and you got to tell the truth. And so when we're in Africa, my wife intercepts some information, and I don't know if it was a phone call, and said that we're not going to give you the loan anymore. Well, keep in mind, I don't know this. We're in Africa. Uh, we're on a mission trip, doing the will of the Lord, but thank God for praying wine. She said they immediately went into prayer mode. I don't know if everybody in her prayer circle then knew what was going on, but she told them, we need to pray and we need to intercede. She couldn't reach us by phone, but she did leave a message and said, as soon as you hit the States on Wednesday, you need to call. And I think our flight flew in from London uh, to Chicago O'Hara Airport. And as soon as I got in and got service, we're at the airport. And I called and said, hey, what's going on? She said, You're not, we're not going to get the loan. I said, we're not going to get the loan. And by that time, it's late. So I couldn't call the bank to see what the problem was. And uh, so we got in touch with the chairman of the board. And the chairman of the board says, yes, I heard already. And he said, but this is what I want you to do. I know you were in Africa. And I know that you're planning on moving your congregation in Friday. He said, let's meet at the law firm as we had already scheduled. And he said, we will talk then. And by this time, we're tired. We haven't had sleep. We've been up. And I'm saying, God, and my wife said to me, she says, don't worry about it. We've already prayed. God's got this. He's going before us. So when I tell you that God has a track record, when I tell you in a time like this, you have access in the invisible realm, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm not telling you something that's mystical and far-fetched. I'm telling you something that's real from a spiritual reality standpoint. So I went on to bed, and Thursday we meet at the law firm, and uh, the chairman of the board is there because he understands what we're dealing with. He understands we're fighting a spirit of racism with the bank. We're fighting a spirit of racism with his pastor because his pastor shows up with him. He's expecting us to give him a check from the bank. And the chairman of the board said to me, I said nothing to him about what's going down. All he thinks and knows, he's going to get a check, but he's not going to get a check today. And so we're sitting at the conference table at one of the most prestigious law firms in Johnson County on one of the tall floors, just beautiful law firm. And the chairman of the board says, we understand that there were some problems with the bank. He didn't go into detail. He says, but Dad Vaughn and Reverend Jack we don't want to disappoint you, and we don't want to disappoint the people of your congregation. So what I've done, I've gotten with our lawyers, and I'm telling the pastor, this is the pastor that said you people, his first time hearing it. I'm telling him that we're going to go on and give you the keys today and give you some time to work through this. Don't tell me God won't fix it. When they sing God will work it out, I'm telling you God will work on behalf of his people. When one door closes, don't fool yourself and don't panic. God always has another door to open. So we were able to breathe. We were able to go on and get the keys, go on and freshen up the uh, building that had set stale for so many years and get moved in for our first service. Well, here again, th this racial divide, here again, this chaotic atmosphere uh, uh, gets stirred up in the neighborhood. So as we're moving in, uh, we're getting calls to the number that we had in the office, and people are saying, did you guys buy that building? We live in this neighborhood. We want to know, how did you buy the building? How did you get the building? Because they'd already tried to sabotage some of them, the building. Matter of fact, I was there one day, and two white guys came in uh, from the neighborhood, big, tall guys, and said, I want to know how you got in this building. And so I said a few things to them. I can't remember what it was, but I know they didn't stay too long after I said those things to them. And uh, they eventually left. And people were saying, are they renting? Are they going to be gone? And I'm thinking, wow, is, it, is hatred and prejudice that real among us even in this time? And I concluded by saying, 
Yes, yes, yes. But I'll tell you how God works. And that's when I say to people of color that we have what we have because we have God on our side. And when I hear people saying we prayed enough and we don't need to pray anymore. Yes, you do. You need to pray some more and you need to keep on praying because the only reason we have come this far and have achieved and got what we've done is because we've had a God that fights with us and a God that fights for us. So we're there on 1800 and, and so I'm thinking, okay, we got these keys. This church needs their money. They want their money from the building. The chairman of our board had built a house out south. In South North, uh, North Kent City, rather. And uh, he had built this home and was in his yard, and the neighbors came over, a white neighbor next door came over and wanted to introduce themselves to him. Lady introduced herself to him and, and uh, asked him what he did. He told them, and he asked her what she did, and she told him she was the vice president of a bank. And um, so they got to talking and dialoguing. She was welcoming him to the neighborhood. Again, not all people, not all white people are racist. Not all white people hate blacks. Not all of them are prejudiced. There are some of them that understand. They have walked to the other side of the bottle and they're seeing it from a black person's perspective. So as she was talking to him and he said, let me ask you something. He said, we had applied for X amount of dollars at a bank we had been banking with. And uh, he said, and, uh, and, and the bank all of a sudden decided they weren't give us a loan. And he went into some more conversation uh, with the banker. And, she, and so she said, I tell you what, here's my card. Send me your portfolio. And I'm going to show you how God works. And uh, he got the portfolio, our financial portfolio, sent it to her bank. And I'm telling you today, in less than a week, we had the amount of money that we needed, and that bank looked at our portfolio and said, there is literally no reason why any bank should have turned you down. And we were able to get the monies we needed to finance for the loan, the church that we're now in at 1800 Street, so 1800 Washington. So when you uh, understand that things will cost you, that you may not get what you want when you want it, but if you keep on fighting and keep on fighting, you're going to get it. I want to close with something today as I've shared my story and, um, you know, I'm looking at those still protesting and with all of the events not going into detail, uh, but you know, you're, you're current, you're up, you, you know what we're up against here in America, but I want to tell you something, it's worth the fight. I want to say to the next generation that's out there to know you're not fighting by yourself. Though many of us that are older cannot be out there with you and the COVID-19 that's still running rapid. But I'm telling you that if you allow God to fight with you, if you allow God to fight for you, I believe there's victory on the other side of this. I just wanted to share my heart to let you know that if you are black or, and you have been around for any length of time or you just got here, you're going to taste this in some form or some fashion. But you never let the rejection of other people cause you to become bitter, but it should make you better. And Maya Angelou, one of my favorite poets, wrote this. She says, I never had the feeling that I had to carry the weight of somebody's ignorance around with me. And that was true for racists who wanted to use the N-word when talking about me or about my people or the stupidity of people who really wanted to belittle other folks because they weren't pretty or they weren't rich or they weren't clever. I'm saying to you, protest in the strength of our God who knows how to fight. He'll go before you, he'll go with you, he'll fight with you, and he'll fight for you. Until then, continue to call it out and let's just tell the truth.